All right. We are launching a new podcast. I have Dr. Mike Nagler with me today. So excited. Ooh. Mike is the superintendent of Mineola Public Schools, uh, began your career as a teacher in New York City, um, got your doctorate from Columbia University, and accepted a position in Mineola in 1999. You have been there since then um, and are strongly committed to the mission of creating lifelong learners to contribute positively to a global society. I know that mission is still alive and well, um, and it's because of your leadership and you are the author of the new book, The Dev Leader. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Super excited about it. Super excited for this conversation, but I would love for you to start off by just sharing a little bit about who you are. What are some of the experiences that have shaped you as the educator and leader that you are today? Sure. So I, I'm a New York City kid. I was born and raised a product of New York City public schools, uh, Binghamton State, Brooklyn College. So I, um, I really have a, an affection for urban settings and I started my career there. Uh, when I moved to Mineola, I was still, I made a lateral move from assistant principal to the middle school to the middle school out here and very quickly became the high school principal and, and moved to central office. I, I think the, the appreciation for the work that teachers do in urban settings is always ingrained in me. And, uh, it, you know, when you move to the suburbs, I don't think they realize some of the luxuries they have uh, not dealing with the bureaucracy that urban settings typically have. Uh, I don't think kids are ever the problem. They, you know, that's yeah. they, no matter where you are, the kids are kids. I think the, the systems really hinder the creativity and the ability to, to do what you want. So as I, I took on this role as superintendent, I, I also had uh, uh, my two children pretty much uh, right before I began in 2009. And, and becoming a dad really affected my thinking about teaching and learning and about what a school should deliver for its families. Because I'm, I'm really big on this notion that we're a service industry and mm -hmm. and, we should be going out of our way for kids. They're not the inconvenience for the adults that work there. And that, that fuels a lot of my passion and a lot of my fire. Um, you know, I, I'm a little disenchanted with my kids' uh, school system. So I try to uh, create ones that uh, I want for my own kids. And uh, a lot of the work we do in Mineola is, is with, that, with that at the forefront. I love that. You know, I, I feel the same way as a mom. It is, um, you know, it is eye opening. I think going from being a teacher and being in the classroom and thinking you're meeting the needs of kids and then you come home and you raise these two children or more and they're they're different and they have different needs. And um, it's it shifted my thinking as well about not only what's possible, but what's really necessary in our school systems. So I love that you lead with that um, that frame of mind. Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about this before. It's a, we get frustrated with what our kids are experiencing, and it's like, what? Why? It doesn't have to be that way. What? Why? Why are they doing this? I mean, it's right. just silly, you know. And and you have kids that want to learn. Let's let's tap into that instead of making them do all this stuff they don't want to do. Yeah, and I think your um, point about the urban systems or just the systems that get in the way. Sometimes if we just did less, not necessarily more, but just did, did less stuff, jump through less hoops, put less structures um, in place, we would actually get to the learning and get to those places that are much more effective than, than what we try to do to standardize and make sure everyone's um, getting the same thing. Yeah, I think it's also a lack of trust in, in our profession. You know, I, I'm a big believer that the teacher, we're in a teaching profession. It's not a job. And that we have to have respect for our teachers as professionals and entrust them to do the right thing. And, um, you know, th that doesn't always work out. But by and large, if you trust people, that they're, they're going to, they, they, that are well-intentioned people, you're going to get good results. And I think that's, that's part of my philosophy here 
is is I want I want them to have autonomy to do a lot of different things, but uh, within a framework of where we're trying to go. Yeah, and I will we'll dive into the dev leader a little bit. Um, and I, but I think that that's an important distinction. There's a lot of like, well, just give them autonomy. When we talk about learner centered practices, people often assume that means just let them do whatever they want, whether it's yeah. kids or teachers or principals. And that's not that's not exactly what I'm advocating. That doesn't ever really just go well. But if you have clear goals and that framework, you can allow for a lot more autonomy within those those frames that can get people um, to meet the goals. And like you said, we're teaching. And yep. if a teacher doesn't have autonomy to do things in the classroom and they're always looking over their shoulder to do it right, we can't expect them to really meet the needs of the students that they're serving. Yeah, I, I love the the Rick DeFore, you know, the tight and loose. What, mm -hmm. what are we really tight about and what are we loose about? I, I think if you, you develop good systems and a, and a nice framework to work um, within, then you could be loose about how it happens. You know, and there's so there's so many different um, things in place that write that ship. I mean, it's it, you're not going to have some loose cannon. There's so many checkpoints that it doesn't it doesn't. I, I don't even know where people come up with it. You know, I, I think they just want to fabricate things that don't exist to make excuses for why they're not doing things. And it makes us feel comfortable, right? If I'm yeah. if I'm in control of the process, it makes me feel more comfortable. Yeah. Uh, so you, I mean, obviously the dev leader is, it's a great book. Um, one of the reasons I love it is because I've been able to be in the district. So I've met the people, I've seen the systems, I've seen your students share with me the amazing work that they're doing. Um, and the dev leader, your book really captures that work and the process, but also the framework. Um, and, and I think that's what makes it such a special book. And you talk about the importance of painting a picture. This is even just in the first chapter. Um, and so talk to us a little bit. You've been in Mineola for almost 19 years. Um, you've, you've, been lead, you've been in the system and, and had the opportunity to lead through a lot of change. Um, why is painting the picture such a critical part of leadership? So... Uh, Dev, Dev is an acronym for design thinking, entrepreneurial, and visionary planning. And I think the, the new age of leaders in our fast-paced world need to be more forward thinking about what's, what, what are kids experiencing in, um, in life and in their social um, circles, and then how, how are we doing uh, things about it in school? For me, painting a picture is the, if you think about painting a picture, the artist can spend hours and hours and hours to get to the complete finished product. Mm -hmm. And most artists are never satisfied with the complete product. But in order to paint the picture, you have to have it in your head. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to have this imagery of what you want to accomplish, and then you work toward accomplishing that. The, I think the trick with leadership is it's got to get out of your head and it's got to get in everybody's head. So you want them to visualize this picture that you haven't painted yet because collectively we're going to paint it together. And I, um, I use that analogy because I think people can can see that they say what's that guy's name bob ross they could see bob, oh, yeah. bob ross you know happy little mistakes and they could they could see that um coming to life and you also understand that you're going to make mistakes you know, the brush strokes aren't always going to be perfect you, you're going to you maybe paint over something maybe get rid of a color that you don't like or all, all there's a whole process that occurs to get that picture and I think that um, we don't pay enough attention to that. Right. Well, yeah. I think it goes back to our initial conversation because if people don't have the picture in their head of what they're supposed to do, they don't have that alignment around the shared vision, then they're making small micro moves that they're just there. That's the micromanagement, right? To get from right. step A to step B, instead of really understanding the big picture and how you make the right moves to get there. Yeah, see, so in the, to further that analogy, I say, if you paint this picture and then make it into a puzzle, 
you now you now can operationalize it. You can now I'm going to work on this one piece, but I know this piece when I start adding more pieces to it is going to build out the picture I want. And you can get very strategic in okay, I'm going to take puzzle pieces in the four corners and then I'm going to build in from there. So it's it's an analogy I think people uh, leaders can grasp uh, the conceptual part of it and then you can actualize, once you take it down to uh, the size of here's the piece, let's get all the players involved and build mm -hmm. and keep building the puzzle. It's a lot more manageable. Well, and way more fun when you're doing yeah. it together, right? You're, you're part of the team. And I know that that's um, very much what I saw in Mineola visiting is people feel like they're part of the process. I'm not just a pawn being moved around. I'm someone who's actually part of putting this together and creating those steps to get to the vision. Yeah, I mean, I have great respect for, for teachers as professionals and, and when they operate as professionals, yeah, I think you, you, you can do anything. You can do anything in the school system. Um, and, and that is, and the respect it has to include them in the process, you, you yeah. know, and, and um, listen to them, hear, them, hear the, the hurdles help them jump the hurdles, understand what the obstacles are. Don't, don't make excuses for why something failed. It failed. We did it collectively. It failed, but now we're going to regroup and, and we're going to make it work. Right. So um, we don't do enough of that in schools. Uh, you know, that's the whole design thinking process is when um, I love this notion of a startup, you know, these startup companies never put out a complete product. They have something called the the, the MEV, the the um, minimal MVP, excuse me, the minimal viable product. Mm -hmm. As long as I know it, it, it it's going to have tons of glitches, but I don't care. I'm going to get it out there, and then I'm going to get the feedback, and I'm going to fix whatever was broken. And they have this whole process where they just go out. They know it's beta. They know it's not going to work, but they're right there, ready to fix it. As the problems come, they're boom, 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 boom and I get a better product. We don't do that in schools. We want this fully baked thing that really is may or may not work. And we're gonna take a year in rolling it out and then it's not gonna work and we throw our hands up and it, it failed. Right, that's the initiative, right? Like the that's silver right. bullet, we're gonna do this initiative this year and then move on the next year. Um, I, I admittedly struggle with that, right? Like the, the startup, I know it's right. And I'm always forcing myself to try and put something out early, but it's hard, right? It's hard because um, you know, you're opening yourself up for feedback and critique. And that's important. You know, everything I read, um, one of my favorite books is um, the founder of Pixar, um, Creativity Inc., and they talk yeah. about like all of our movies suck at first, right? <laughs> all of our movies are really bad and they only get better through the process. So intuitively, I know that. But then when I see educators and talk to educators, they're like, but we have to be perfect on our first try, right? There's this perfection that plagues us. And if we just got better at trial and error and getting things out there and really getting comfortable with evolving in the process, um, we would be so much better. Yeah, I, I think that notion of, um, I call it ENR thinking, uh, ev it's evolution, not a revolution. And if you think of the major um, educational reform movements over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, and this several books written about right. this, um, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as uh, educational reform, you know, full scale. It'll happen in pockets and it'll happen mm -hmm. differently, but the revolution is not going to happen. We're not going to get rid of standardized testing tomorrow. It's not going to happen. But, but we can evolve. Um, I like this expression, you know, we, we need to create a bridge between what we want to do and what we have to do. Mm -hmm. we, we need to do both. We need to give equal attention to the things we have to do and the things we want to do. And then this bridge that we build across that chasm is, is the evolution of ideas. Right. You know, and that and that's my whole really my the my whole philosophy is we're gonna go out and it it this idea is gonna change five, six, seven times. Well, and getting and, getting that out there and letting people know that it is gonna change. Here's the picture of where we're going. This first attempt, 
it's not it but it's, it's our best attempt yet. And I, I appreciate the call out of this revolution or transforming everything. There's no policy coming forward tomorrow by the government or there's, there's no, like you said, no testing that's just gonna be abolished, but we have to start thinking of alternate systems and how can we start to do things that elevate the things that we care about more rather than just say this is the way it is and we're just going to go along doing things even though we know they're not right for the world we live in yeah i, I think that's the whole learner center model so you, yeah. you talk about um how do we move to a learner centered model it's it's you know it's like eating an elephant how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time so you there has to you have to paint a picture right. of how am I going to make learning visible? How am I going to give students the opportunity to make choices? How am I going to give them opportunities to pursue things that they're excited about? When you can point out all of those opportunities you're mm -hmm. giving our learners, then you're moving. Yep. You know, you're evolving into something else. And then the next step would be, okay, how do we, how do we add more? How do we scale it? How do we put in a different grade? Those things, and then how do I get feedback? How am I, what do my teachers think how we should do this? What yes. are they comfortable in doing? What are they anxious about doing? You know, it's all these conversations that move the needle instead of waiting for someone to say, okay, we're, by fiat, we're gonna change everything about public ed. Right, and here's the new approach. We're gonna abandon right. everything. And like, that's where the evolution I think is important. There are things we're doing that are great. There are things that are working. It's identifying those bright spots, those practices, and thinking about how to make them more rather than less. Um, and like you said, getting that feedback, making sure we're opening classrooms, we are sharing our practices because we're growing, not because um, we're not good enough. And I think that's the fear I hear a lot. If I'm changing my practices to something different, you're telling me everything I've done before isn't good. Right, and that's a mentality we need to get away, do away with, also. Yeah, I mean, we're launching a new, um, a new LMS that um, we're trying to create pathways. So mm -hmm. we have we have an integrated curriculum. We have tons of um, work that our that our teachers have created that that um, we use across grade levels. And the question really came up: um, Well, what are we going to put in these pathways? I said, well, why are we deciding what we're putting in the pathways? We, we created the pathway. We know the standard where go whatever the standard is. Um, the teachers should be filling that pathway. That's what they do. What, why, right. you know, and they have the, the stuff, but you have to see it as this wonderful opportunity to have them collaborate and agree on, well, this is the work we collectively want to do. These are my little things that I'm going to do, but it's all part of a bigger picture of this pathway. Yeah, and, and getting clear. And then you know what? Some of it's going to work and some of it won't. And you'll have to get feedback. Yep. You'll have to get students to be involved and learn. Um, and that's that'll be a great, um, a great thing to learn this year. And one of the things you said, um, we've talked about this and you talked about in the book also, is... Um, not using the word pilot. So I'm hearing you say you're starting a new LMS, you're thinking about some new systems this year, but you don't use the word pilot, you use phase one instead. How does this yeah. change mindset or how does this help you um, in that evolution? To me, the word pilot is a connotation that it's, it's short term. It's something we're trying, we're not investing in, we're not committed to it. Eh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try it and see what happens. And I think it's doomed for failure as soon as you, you say it. Um, I, and I think um, the other piece to that is they pilot it in, in it is an equity side for me. It's like, all right, I'm gonna, we're gonna try it in this classroom. Well, what about all the children in the other classrooms? What, what, you know, that's, that's not right. So if you, we do things in phases because we believe that we're gonna iterate on it, we're gonna redesign it and we're gonna build it out better in the next phase. And we'll always do it at either a grade level or a subject. At the high school, we'll do it for you know a subject area. Mm -hmm. But we never do it one class. Yeah. So we want that experience to be the entire third grade is going to do whatever XYZ initiative is. And it's we're going to phase it in. 
Yeah. And you know, we call out the phases too. It's like, so this LMS is the first year, it, it's, um, we're dealing with proficiency scale. So we're shifting, we're shifting to proficiency scales. Mm -hmm. And we know we, we have three different types of proficiency scales. We have our standards, we have our cross-cutting concepts, and then we have our SEL or, or func you know, executive functioning things. Mm -hmm. We know the system can't handle all three of those. And so we're rolling out the standards. That's the big one. That's the, the beast. We're going to roll that out. And we're going to start asking teachers, do you, how's it going? Do, do you need right. more training? Do you see opportunities where we can introduce some other types of scales and let it be a little organic in how right. we roll that out? Um, and, the, and over the course of the next three years, probably sooner, but at a minimum, phase one, two, and three will introduce the new types of scales and will introduce what we're doing in third and fourth grade next year. We'll introduce fifth grade the following year. Um, so it's, it's, we're very purposeful in understanding what the system can handle, what our teachers can, can um, do well. I don't want to say handle because my teachers can handle anything. It, that's not the that's not the point is what are they going to do well in right. in when they roll it out and and then how do we add how do we get their feedback and add and, and you know stay with the cycle that we've yeah. created i like that you pointed out it's it's an equity issue i've always had an issue with like like only only these teachers who want to are going to use technology only these teachers who are you know interested are going to do this program then it just becomes I, as a parent or as a, as a teacher, it's because of my interest or what I'm willing to do, not because there's a greater vision and not because I'm part of the system. So it goes back to, we've painted a picture, we're clear about what we want to accomplish, and we're going to use these phases to ensure that we're doing it systematically and that we're learning along the way and that everybody gets the best experience possible. Yeah. I mean, I've heard my colleagues say that, um, you know, when they do pilots, they're going to they're going to guilt the teacher that's not doing it into doing it. And, you know, they'll be shamed. There's a public shaming going to happen. And, you know, then miraculously, they're going to want to do it. I, I, I don't see it. Again, I think when you treat people as professionals and we treat mm -hmm. teaching as a profession, there's an expectation that comes with that, that, you know, we work hard, we love kids. Those are our expectations. And we're going to personalize and, and move instruction to to be appropriate for individual kids and that's our expectation here that's not something that i i you know i applaud oh look what you did you personalize no that's what we do mm -hmm. and what do you need to do it you know my job's to help you do it so what 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 aren't we giving you to make that happen that's such an important distinction between here's what we do here you are part of a system a lot of times we think about teachers as independent contributors. You go in your classroom, you know, I, I hold you accountable and I micromanage the things you have to use versus here's what we do. Here's our vision here in Mineola or whatever district. This is what we, this is what we ascribe to. This is our mission. Here's the tools, but you have a lot of leeway in how you go about it, but we're all moving in the same direction. Uh, and, and I don't think that happens enough. I think we either um, are too, too much of a micromanage the process, you have to be on the same page at the same time, or do whatever you want to do. And the experience widely varies for kids. And it's not a cohesive um, learning experience that gets kids where they really need to be. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think the 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 thing that we, we, we a lot of times where we fall short is we don't have a plan and we don't have what we're trying uh, what we're trying to measure what we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. when you lay that out in the beginning you know, at the end of the year i like to see you know, 100 percent of the grade is you know we're using our badge books and and everyone's familiar and comfortable with our assessment system that's everybody that's not um only the gen ed kids were mm -hmm. making exceptions for special ed kids enl kids can't do it no our expectation is everyone is doing it we they all may not be successful but again it's the first phase so then we have a conversation well how are we going to make them more successful within the system we created 
Yep. Well, so one of the things that you wrote in the book, and I want to read this quote, the most effective way to scale innovation and change is to allow teachers and staff to be the designers. After all, they are the implementers. So this kind of just goes along with what we've been talking about. And I had the pleasure of listening to your new teachers. I think they were in year three, which I love that these are still kind of your new teachers that you're supporting. Um, in many cases, they're veteran teachers by three years. Um, but in any case, I got to hear teachers really present their learning from their learning cycles. So they had opportunities to work with your instructional leads. Shout out to Nicole and Jen, you know, as they were leading this, um, this group of teachers. Uh, but the teachers all, if not every one of them, most of them highlighted the mission at the beginning of their presentation. They, they were really aligned to the mission of creating global citizens. Um, and, but they all had very different projects, right? They all were, um, you know, they were talking about their badge books, which we'll dive into a little bit. They're talking about how they're doing um, goal setting with students. And I was really just inspired by the continuity of the practices, but how personalized these teachers' projects were to their own classroom, their own needs, and their own goals. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'd love for you to talk, like, what, how, does, how does that come about? So what you're describing is what we call our new teacher workshops. So, and we switched it to new educator workshops because mm -hmm. not all of them were teachers. So we, we create cohorts of new teachers. It, it's, um, if you're a new teacher starting in September for us, your, your cohort, I don't know what number we're up to, but it doesn't matter what level you, what level you teach, what subject you teach, what your role is in the school system, you are all together as a cohort mm -hmm. of first years, very Hogwartish. So <laughs> the, the first years, um, and then we have a four year sequence um, where we, we, they do 15 hours each year and we mm -hmm. give them a, a service credit. So they will work on their salary differentials doing that. Um, but the year you saw it was an action research year. So mm -hmm. the, we asked the, that cohort, the third year cohort, to design an action research problem and implement it in your class. And you were basically testing a theory or a practice that we're curious about. And um, the instructional admin, the instructional leaders, we, that's their title here, they supervise it and oversee it and coach and help them do some of the research on it and answer questions. And then the teachers go and do it. And it, to me, it's very interesting because it's, it's this notion, we tell you all this stuff is great, but we tell you this is good for kids, but I don't know if we really know that, or is it really good for your kids? So go try it out and, mm -hmm. and you tell us, what do you, what do you think? And, and that's what you saw, you, you witnessed the um, presentations of that group telling us what they thought about, about their practices. Uh, and yeah. then of course, we like everything tied back to our mission. Our mission is what drives us. We, we speak about it all the time. And um, it's, it's part of our overall vision to how we want to personalize and be appropriate, preparing kids for a future they don't know basically. Yeah, and, and I think that these, the way you induct teachers, right, um, you know, that was what my dissertation was on is new teacher induction, and it's textbook in a way of getting the network, um, mentors, working together with structured learning about the system, but opportunities to personalize, um, and building those mindsets and practices into your teachers throughout those first four years, no doubt builds that culture where you've set the foundation, you've supported them, and then they become the mentors and the more experienced teachers to support new teachers along the way. And those yeah. practices then are theirs, right? They've tested them, they've done the action research, and they know how to refine and grow. Um, and finally, at the end of the year, they have the accountability to share their learning with their colleagues and the administration. It's powerful. Yeah, I, I've, we've been doing it now for four years, and I think it's one of our best programs. And I think for me that the, 
you know, I ask teachers all the time because ultimately they prepare a tenure portfolio for me that we sit down and we have an interview about mm -hmm. it. And I said, like, you, you glow about this program. So come on, mm -hmm. tell me the truth. You're really, you're just saying that, or do you really, do you really find value in it? And to a teacher, they, it's, it's meaningful to them because they're, they're given the opportunity to try something and, and do it with someone. An important distinction here is we don't group them by subject. Mm -hmm. We don't group them by, by uh, grade level that they teach. So it's wide open. You know, we had a kindergarten teacher and a physics teacher working on a project together. It, it, you know, that, that's very powerful when you hear the outcomes of those, of those uh, projects. Yeah, you're building the networks, you're building the connections across the district. They, they have friends and they're, you know, there's powerful things that kindergarten teachers can learn from mm -hmm. the high school teachers and vice versa. Uh, so I, I love it. Um, one of the projects that I saw were the badge books and we talked a little bit about learning progression. So I wanna back up a little bit. Um, the reason you're using these badge books and doing some of these practices is because trying to broaden the view of success, really what does success yep. look like and, and how do we start measuring that? So will you tell us a little bit about the badge books and, and how that has evolved in, um, in Mineola? Well, it's, it's definitely an evolution. <laughs> I just had a meeting the other day about the next iteration of it. Um, I visited Elizabeth Forward in Pittsburgh. Todd Karushkin is the soup there. And Bart Rocco was the soup. Uh, he'll yell at me if I don't give him credit. <laughs> we'll make sure to give him credit. Uh, yes. So I saw this pre-K badge book, a digital badge book that they were using that I loved. And I brought it back to my team and we rolled it out and, and we did not have a successful rollout. And, and basically the, the problem that kept coming back was the, the digital nature of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the time, not any longer, but at the time I fancied myself a very tech forward person and my team was really nervous to say, the digital stuff wasn't working. So we pivoted, we, you know, I had this epiphany and said, why don't we just make it a sticker book? Why don't we dump all the digital side and just make it a sticker book and make it very simple. You know, a badge for, I can tie my shoes, we get a badge. We can count one to 10, we get a badge. And we did that. Uh, and the parents loved it and the kids loved it. So, and teachers loved it. So we moved it to K and then we moved it to one and then we moved it to two we're about to launch year four, grade four uh, in September. And every year it changes. Mm -hmm. Every year we add something to it. The second grade, we started with micro badges. We broke the standards down to bite-sized pieces. This year's implementation in third grade did not go smoothly. We had, we, we had several issues with the tech company we were using to build out digital badges. Mm -hmm. So we had to abandon that. That's what led us to uh, empower as our new LMS and mm -hmm. proficiency scales. And the whole while, all of these conversations was we don't give report cards. Th this has replaced report cards for parents. We don't give one, two, three, four. I think that whole system is idiotic. I don't know oh, why man. anybody. I don't know why anybody would use it. It confuses parents. And that's not to say we haven't had a struggle because, you know, right this morning, I got a phone call about we need to we need to put out some publications educating parents about what we're trying to accomplish because they want grades. They have to have grades. And, you know, parents have this this uh, uncanny ability to want to compare their children to everyone else's child. And we try to redirect them to why don't you compare your child to the work they should be doing yeah. and where they are in the their um progress in the work yep so okay so i'm going to back us up a little bit for people who are mm -hmm. listening they're like okay you just talked about badge books and you were talking about kids tying their shoes and now you don't have report cards okay let's so so when when i'm in mineola i if i'm i'm a parent i know that or like let's say i'm, well, I'm a teacher first i'm a student mm -hmm. We've got really clear about what our goals are at each grade level. So from kindergarten, second, third, fourth, we're really clear what those desired outcomes are. And it might be 
knowing sounds. It might be reading with fluency. It might be that I can compare and contrast characters. So we're looking at the standards, we're looking at what's grade age appropriate, and we're getting really clear on what that outcome is. Every and then badge, if yeah, every badge is a piece of a standard or a complete standard. Okay. And so if I'm a student, it's also age appropriate. And I know, and I can look at this and see, here are my goals for the year or for the quarter, whatever this, this time chunk is. Yeah. And so pro probably my most famous line quoted in the district is kids need to know what they don't know. I say it ad nauseum. And okay. the only way they can know what they don't know is to have a benchmark of, or, or a knowledge of what they're working on. So if I'm working on a specific badge, uh, let's say it's second grade, this mm -hmm. micro badge is a component of a larger standard, but I need to have some knowledge base before I can do an application. So I'm, I'm working on something that's a the foundational piece of the standard. I know that. And that's, that badge can only be earned if you meet the criteria. There's no fuzziness here. There's no mm -hmm. subjectivity. Here's the criteria, you meet it or you don't. If you don't, you don't get the badge. And, and the teachers were like freaking out. out. They were freaking out. You, you, you're not going to give kids, they're going to be crying all over the place. I said, no, they're going to, we're going to help them understand that they need to continue working on this. And that's where we developed our neuron stickers. We do a lot of with brain science and we, we teach kids how their brains work in order for them to understand it's a growth mindset that if I, if I build enough neurons, I'm going to make my connections and, and I'm going to get a zap and I'm going to go on and I'm going to move on to the next batch. And we have language about it. And, and Jen Machen, who you mentioned earlier, is uh, one of my rock stars that does this. But the, the idea is, I don't need to tell you you're a two or a three in the progress of a standard. Right. I'm going to be very discreet in the knowledge you've obtained mm -hmm. and what you haven't. And you can set a goal now that I want to get earn the next badge. Right. And it's and and we make pathways to help kids with different work. But all of this is around the notion that it, it, learning is developmentally appropriate at different ages. And kids learn at different paces. You know, it's the whole co compensatory ed uh, uh, dialogue. Right. But, it, you know, you can do it in such a way where you don't need to put a number on a kid. We know what the standard is. We know what the expectation is at the end of the year. That's the other problem with one, two, three, yeah. four. It drives me crazy. You, you should not be a four in the first trimester because how are you exceeding unless you're a little genius? You're not exceeding that standard. It's well, going to take you the whole year to get there. And I mean, you know, we've had this, the, the four is made up, right? Yeah, like yeah. I just talked to a leader. I won't call him out, but he goes, I wish I would not have done the one, two, three, four system because everyone can, confuses the one, two, three, four with A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Three is the standard. And we've got all caught up in, well, the four is application of the standard. And we, we make yeah, up yeah. all these things to fit a four point model when it's the standard or not. And, and I really love the badge books and the competency-based piece of it because you're making it transparent for teachers and for students and for families, what we want kids to know and do and whether or not they've got there. Yeah, right? and I think, I think that's, look, that's what school is about, isn't it? You're supposed to help children, help learners understand what, what they don't know and where, where they should be moving next. And we don't develop systems like that. I, it's, it's, it's it's counterintuitive to me, the way we assess kids. And my, my big pet peeve is we, we don't have multiple measures. We don't have right. multiple ways that we assess. We don't create portfolios. That, that's the best way. There isn't one, one, one exam that's right. gonna assess a child appropriately. And my other pet peeve is we don't look at their own work. How do you know if you don't look at their work? Right. I mean, this whole notion that um, I'm going to compare myself to another kid, how? Right. So, I mean, you're right. When we know what we want students to know and do, we have clear measures. They're part of the process. They're building portfolios. They're looking at their own progress. Their teachers are setting up pathways. This is the future, right? This is the picture we want to paint 
of what's possible in education. And when I think about Abby and Zach, so I've shared Zach's report card all over the country, yeah. right? He's got like, he, <laughs> he starts, loves that, by the way. He loves that. He told me yeah. he gave me his permission, but he starts with a three and then he goes to a two of what, right? And none of it really means anything other than it's like a general average of how he's performing that quarter and what the teacher wanted to put on the report card instead of really understand, or maybe what his effort was, right? Like yeah, I have yeah. also shared, Abby got needs improvement in science because she didn't copy the worksheet or she didn't copy from the board onto the piece of paper. That is not actually any evidence of what she knows or the skills that she has in science. So being able to use these competencies and these learning progressions um, is not just a one, two, three, or four. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. It is about what it is that you know and can do and how you're set up for that next level. Yeah, so I was scrambling. I know it's a podcast, but anyone watching on um, on YouTube. So this is our new badge for the third grade. It's basically a proficiency scale, but you notice that we put the four or the transfer. We're, we're not using numbers. We're using knowledge, application, and transfers, mm -hmm. but we put it on the vertical next to knowledge and application. So the transfer piece is Throughout. not hierarchical. Yes. It's complementary to the knowledge and the application. This was an epiphany by one of my young superstars, Samantha Sanchez, who was like, I think we're gonna put it on the side. And I'm like, I love it. I love, love it. it, I love it, I love it. Because, and this was the other conversation with the superintendent who said, I wish I had never used the one, two, four, because he said, well, the four is the application. I'm like, so if four is the application, you're going to prevent a kid from doing the authentic work because they don't have the basic knowledge. That's where a lot of people get the motivation to yeah. go with the knowledge level because there's authenticity and relevance. And so if we're only treating these skills like it's a linear progression, we're missing out on the opportunity to really get kids in excited and motivated by work that is more real because we're stuck at the knowledge level. Yeah. And it's a huge lift off the teacher's shoulders to say, hey, look, we're, we're focused on the application level. This is, this is the meeting the standard. And everything else um, your learner does is, is, is a bonus. But you don't have to decide if it's a four because parents want to see a four. So it's, it's um, a bit of a mind shift to say, I, if we eliminate the numbers and we're very specific on how you get to this application level, is that enough? I don't know the answer. To that. We'll, we can come back next year and I'll give you a better answer. But um, right. you know, that's the struggle. Yeah, and I think that it is about parents and it's a conversation. So mm -hmm. I know if you just send this home, it's going to be like, wait, this is different. But I have to trust the amount of conversations I've had with parents, we're both parents, that if we see a new way to understand what our kids know and do, this is a better system and we will embrace it, right? Yep. But but we're we're stuck in old models of what we think success is because that's what we're used to. So we have to bring people into the conversation just like we're bringing teachers in. Yeah, one conversation at a time. Yeah. All right, here's a conversation that I've been really excited to have. Um, based on all the things that we've been talking about, you are launching in the fall, a new high school. Uh, yes. Synergy. So sure. uh, let's, Let's let's talk a little bit about um, first, where did we talked a little bit at the beginning? You're a parent, you've seen things differently. And I know that your son was a big impetus for thinking about synergy. So do you want to share a little bit about how this yes. got started? Yeah. Yeah. My Zach, his name is James, <laughs> is um, he loves to learn and, and he's a, a very bright boy. Uh, just not that I'm bragging, but he just won uh, LICEF, which is the International Science Fair for Embedded uh, Technologies. So, Congratulations. Um, yeah, it's his mother. It really has nothing to do with me. The, um, the idea behind it is he loves to learn. He's a self-learner. He'll go and learn stuff that he wants to learn. Um, and it's all online. So he, he can figure it all out. He's self-taught himself 
coding, all of this work he did, his school district really had very, very little to do with any of his project. And he tells me often how much he hates school. And, but I said, but, but you love to learn, how do you hate school? And he said, because I don't want to learn what they want to teach. So, you know, it got me thinking, well, how the structure of high school, um, put everything else aside, the structure of high school, period by period, you start, you subject by subject, you know, all the different uh, things we want for kids and demand of kids in each of those periods. Um, how can we change that? Right. And I leveraged the, the COVID, uh, everything was online to say, why don't we put all these subjects in the cloud? And it's all competency-based and kids can tackle them the way we want and we'll give them resources. So we'll give them subject area teachers that they can have office hours with or have mini seminars with. And during the day, when we get them together, we spend a lot of time on executive functioning and collaboration and all the pieces that the workforce wants to see, all the things we profess we want children to know, you know that profile of a graduate. Yep. And that's the work we do during the day. And kids own their day. Uh, you know, our vision is they come in every morning, almost like kindergarten morning meeting, mm -hmm. and um, they have the software ability, uh, the technology capability of planning their day. Mm -hmm. And that plan goes on a giant video wall and everyone can see what their plan for the day is. And we have constant check-ins with them and they check in with the adults to, to get help. And you know, we have a couple of mother hens floating around to make sure that they um, are on task and, and doing what they should be doing. But the ownership of the learning is with them. And we've launched it this current year. We've been building it with the students and co-collaborating on a ton of things and a ton of processes. I've met with the kids several times about design of the new space. We bought a bank that was across the street from our high school. So we're, we gutted it and we're redoing it. Um, and I'm super excited about the possibilities. We're, we're planning to put a, a store in there to, yeah. to teach them entrepreneurship and, and let them make some money during, during school because a lot of our kids need that. Um, we have a full-time social worker on staff that she really is. Um, the, the notion, I missed the whole point, was that it, as you finish your work and you do what we have to do, then you could do what you want to do. So if you have a passion project that you want to pursue, we're going to support that. And if we don't have the knowledge base to do that, we're going to find you mentors and experts to help you do that. So the if you wanted to start a business, we'd have one there. So um, we're still evolving a lot of these things, and you know my the, my philosophy of evolution. But the launch is uh, we're ready to roll. Uh, we'll open the doors in September. We have, we're going to launch with about 35 kids. And then the goal is the following September, whoever wants to go to this type of high school can. And whoever yeah, doesn't, the traditional high school is right across the street. And eventually down the road, we'll mix them up. So if you want to do certain things in a traditional way and others not, you know, phase three or four, we'll, we'll get to that. I love it. And so students can navigate their path. They have access to many of the traditional things that make school fun. So often I hear from kids, well, the school stuff is not fun, but everything right. outside of school is what's fun. So they have access to that, but they have more autonomy and relevance in their day to navigate their path. And Becca, one of your students, yes. um, highlighted, we all love Becca. Um, freshman. Freshman, freshman bro yes. brilliant, brilliant human. But she really hit on the idea of this is a place for connection and belonging. They really want this to be a place where everybody belongs. Everybody has space to deal with their emotions, learn strategies, right? The kids were very, I say kids, the, the teenagers were very adamant that they want to learn the skills, not just to do math and reading and science. They want to learn the skills to really be effective humans and navigate their path. And I'm excited that that gets to be a part of this as well. Yeah, I mean, we were very careful not to call it an alternative school because it's not the, the cognitive ability of all, of all the learners here. There's nothing wrong with that. They, they, 
Um, they're disconnected with school for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, they really span the, the, the gamut, but we, they're all our kids. Yeah. You know, they're all, they're all my kids. So if I'm, if I'm doing what I need to do, I have to find pathways for all of them to have success. And a lot of those pathways are not traditional. And I think the, the big thing for me is if we can change the structure and still accomplish what we need to, and along the way, help, help these learners find their path, we, you know, then, then we're doing our jobs. I love it. And there's too many kids who think that they have to conform to traditional school to fit in and, and creating this openness allows for more kids to figure out who they are and be supported and, um, and valued for who they are, which I think is um, definitely something we need in more schools and more systems across the country, for sure, and world. Yes, I, I agree. I'm excited. I'm excited. It's keeping me going. I, I'm not retiring because I need to. I need to get this done. Love it. Love it. There's your passion project, right? Yes. Like yes. You're there, motivated. There you yes, you're inspired absolutely. to do this. Well, I am so excited um, to see the evolution of it. It is time for our rapid fire questions. So I have a few questions. Try not to overthink them. Just share what comes up. The first one, what is one thing we should stop doing in education? Focusing on ranking and sorting kids by standardized tests. Amen. What is the one thing we should start doing? Listening to students. Yeah. What should we keep doing? Um, personalizing, looking for pathways to, to make it more meaningful. Yes. What, you seem to always have a new project. I think we just talked about it, but is, is there another new project that you're, that you're working on other than Synergy? <laughs> <laughs> well, Synergy and the, and the rollout of, um, we're calling it Jackson 21, but it's the proficiency scales are the two big ones. But we also talked about a, uh, the New York State has a new civics readiness seal for uh, diplomas. So we're gonna be, we're gonna focus in on a bunch of civics things at the high school next year. Awesome. What is one thing that many people don't know about you? Huh. I'm old. <laughs> Do people know you're a spin guru? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about spin, yeah. I. I you know, one of the things leaders need to do is, is make sure we take care of ourselves. Everybody should be taking care of themselves. So I, I do, I do like spin class and I do like Pilates. Um, although my body does not lately, but yes, I, I, my mind does. Nice. What's a favorite quote or saying that you stand by? Oh, I have so many of them. I, I, I'm often say kids need to know what they don't know. I, I like think differently uh, and imagine. There's no, um, why imagine, just do. Yep. You know, all, all of these are, um, it gets to the heart of what we're trying to, what we're trying to accomplish with learners. Love it. What are you grateful for right now? I'm grateful for, for this community and trusting me with their kids and, and some of my crazy ideas. Uh, and I'm grateful for my wife and kids. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for just, I'm very happy to be alive. Very grateful to all the little things in life. Yeah, that's great. Last question. What is your hope for the future of education? I think my biggest hope is that we can we can realize that in many cases we do a disservice to kids and we're not preparing them for the world they are going to go into. We're preparing them for our notion of the world that they're going into. And if I hope anything is we start to realize that in the 13 years they're in school, the world is changing so rapidly that we need to start preparing them differently. And if we can do that, we'll be very successful. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you, Mike. This has been an awesome conversation. Grateful for you and your time and all that you do to create models of what's possible. Yeah, I'm grateful to you as well. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it.